Good morning, Neil. Uh, Neil, I wonder if you would um, introduce yourself and tell, tell us what your official role is, what you are employed in in, a, in, a, in an official capacity at the local authority, please. Good morning, Jed. Yep, my name is Neil Humphreys and my title is uh, Dole's Quality Assurance Manager, which essentially requires me to manage the Deprivation of Liberty Safeguards team at Traffic Council. Wonderful. And um, I, I, my personal experience of, of working with you, Neil, is that, uh, and, and I think most people do, is that if we have, um, <coughs> excuse me, if we have a kind of problem or, or, or a, a dispute of, uh, of a legal nature or in, in relation to a legal technicality, then, then there's one kind of um, cry within the council, which is, um, Talk to Neil. Talk to Neil, because Neil knows all about these things. And um, I think it's fair to say that kind of uh, a lot of the knowledge base for your for your job is uh, a pretty in depth understanding of the, the legal framework that um, surrounds uh, adult social care and adult safeguarding. Is that is that a reasonable thing to say? Uh, yeah, I think this particular area of social work, although it is wider than social work, it's very much based on legislation and the, the processes that you're kind of completing day in day out you can closely link them to key aspects of legislation so it has developed i suppose my skill set and knowledge base in having a, a greater understanding and degree of legal literacy which when you come into this profession you you don't necessarily think that you may need uh, but it certainly does help. So, yeah, it, it has, I suppose, enabled me to to, to build on on that skill set. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, as I say, you are the go-to go-to individual in, in terms of in terms of knowledge around around the kind of legal framework that supports this area of work. So, I think it is very fitting that to, today we're talking about so the part of the the Ancraft. Um, safeguarding week of action uh, there, is, there is a day which is today which is uh, devoted to an un a greater understanding of, of, of the legislation now and, and, and now you and I have talked about how we might talk about this and you know I, I, the one thing we want wanted not to do was to kind of present yet another lecture on sure. you know, the, pr the principles of safeguarding or, or you know um, either the various bits of the care act or whatever so um, what I was going to introduce this by saying you and I have sat on a number of safeguarding adult reviews and a number of committees over the last um, three or four years that we've been working working together. And there is a theme there that we, we, we often discuss, which is, uh, uh, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's a theme, I think, which is about you know, otherwise really proficient and professional practitioners who really care and know uh, their onions in, in relation to adult social care but seem a little bit all at sea, let's say, or uh, a little bit incapable of intervening where they, where they believe somebody's got capacity, uh, but they see on why decision-making, and it's kind of, they can't really get beyond that in a way, and eventually that leads to adverse consequences for the client or for the patient. And it's really, I know you've got a, a case study uh, about Bill, and, and I think it's a really handy way of just, kind of talking about the nuances of that situation and the difficulties that professionals encounter and I would I would ask you if you wouldn't mind just to talk us through that um, case study if you don't mind Neil sure sure um, so just just to start with before we kind of go into the, the, the case study um, the the mental capacity act has got some key principles five five in particular um, and the, the third one is don't treat a person as lacking the capacity to make a decision just because they make an unwise decision. Unfortunately, the way you translate that is most people say everybody's got a right to make an unwise decision. It's not quite worded that way. Uh, and it has given a, a, an over-reliance almost on the fact that um, people... You have to kind of let people do what they want, even if you think they're going to come to harm. So let's introduce uh, Bill. Uh, 
Um, so Bill is a, a typical case that most practitioners, be them carers, district nurses, social workers, GPs, etc., um, most people will have come across people like Bill. So um, Bill's 88 years of age. He lives on his own and has lived in his house for over 60 years. He's uh, a widow. His wife passed away two years ago. And he's got no children. And he also owns the property. Uh, uh-huh. Medically, Bill's got a diagnosis of hypertension, which can lead to him becoming lightheaded and dizzy whenever he stands up. And this has resulted in a number of falls. He's also got type 1 diabetes. Uh, he requires a low sugar diet and insulin injections every morning and every evening. And that's provided by district nurses. His blood sugars used to be very well managed. Uh, but since his wife passed away, he's extremely low in mood and reluctant to eat and drink. Um, and has a very kind of poor diet. Um, he's lost lots of weight and he's now at very high risk of a hyperglycemic attack, which obviously can lead to a coma and then death. Sure. So you've got a picture of somebody who's had a big change in their life, obviously grieving uh, the loss of his wife has there's no family around um, and has, has a number of health, health issues which could deteriorate rapidly. Physically, very independent, although, as we said, he's a falls risk and he can wash and dress himself, etc. He's also um, got a, a private carer, do some housework, and unfortunately, he hasn't got a large circle of friends. Um, he and his wife very much kept to themselves to themselves. And as, as mentioned, they, they haven't really got any no children or a wider extended family. So over the last three months, Bill's been looking more unkempt. The district nurses have noticed that he's, he's wearing the same clothes for days and he's still continuing to refuse to eat some drink. He just doesn't feel like it. Nice. He spends long periods sat in the armchair and not going to bed and preferring to stay in his chair all night. He's clearly not managing his continence care um, and he's also in remission for cancer uh, of the bladder in which he's got a catheter in situ. And nurses are concerned that this is always very, very full whenever they come to see him, but he's just kind of got no motivation. Despite them raising the concerns to Bill, talking to him about what they're concerned about, he insists that he can manage and he insists that he doesn't want any care or support of any kind in this area. He okay. refuses his offers of seeing his GP, refuses to permit anybody from referring him onwards. He's still happy to accept his insulin, and he's, he's almost delighted when he, whenever the district nurses come, um, because this appears to be the only human contact that he has. He's prescribed antidepressants and uh, medication to improve his blood pressure. Um, but on occasions, he, he won't always take it. And increasingly, he's more at risk of falls. So at that point, what we've noticed certainly coming through the SARS jet is people like Bill not being referred anywhere because of lack of consent. Yeah, I mean, I, and I would, um, sorry, Neil, I would say that um, you know Bill is so typical. It, 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 you know, People, folk like Bill, whether male or female, but particularly male, in fairness, 
must feature on everybody's case loads, mustn't they? Because because this yeah. Bill, Bill is, and, and obviously for obvious reasons, you you put this together as a you know as a really good example to work with. But but Bill is a typical example of the kind of problem clients, if you did, not problem clients, not a nice way of putting it, but the kind of yeah. difficulties around this application of the law and the need to be legally literate um, that, 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 that practitioners face every day because we all have bills or you all have bills on your caseload. Sure. Yeah, so just summarising the, the risks for Bill, we've got on the one hand Again, some interpretations of this, this almost innate right to make an unwise decision. And on the other hand, we've got the fact that he's at risk of unmanaged diabetes, which could lead to death. He's losing weight. He's even lost the desire to get up, go to the, the kitchen and make a cup of tea, so he's, he's at risk of dehydration. His skin integrity could quite easily break down if he's um, lost weight dehydrated and sat down all the time on the chair, not not getting up to go to bed. But this further increases his risk of falls. And he's also got a mental disorder in the form of depression, which again you could argue is possibly the underlying factor to his, some of his escalating physical health problems. And ultimately, he's becoming a risk of self-neglect. And more often than not, if you self neglecting yourself, you're also self-neglecting the environment in which you live, which can become unhygienic and risk all kinds of uh, kind of breakdown, disrepair, infestations, etc. Sure. So, what we tr what we've noticed certainly in the patterns and trends coming through the SARS is is this sense that professionals feel like their hands are tied if somebody has the capacity to say no. And again, as mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, this is because of principle three of the Mental Capacity Act. And I think what's also become much more prevalent, which is kind of added to uh, the misinterpretation, you could say, of principle or three is is the rise of data security and information governance for example you've got the general data protection rules sorry general data protection regulation as part of the data protection act 2018 and all practitioners are, are, are kind of encouraged to train every year refresh your training and not share information unless there's a reason to do so and I think that the pair of them together can leave practitioners feeling like, well, I've tried to encourage the likes of Bill, but he said, no, I've, I've got to respect that. Sure. And what we would like practitioners to consider is that there are other legislations which also underpin our practice. And I'll just run through uh, a couple of those, actually, the, the, the most uh, important ones, in, in my opinion. Uh, the first one being the Human Rights Act of 1998, which states that interference must be justified and be for a particular purpose. Now, that, to say, Neil, that's interference in a perfect person's private life, is it? That's is that right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. right. And it, it goes on to say that justification could be protection of health. Um, I mean, it also says prevention of crime, protection of the rights and freedoms of others. Um, the CARE Act, essentially what a lot of social workers in particular rely on um, to safeguard people, states that a safeguarding referral can be raised to the local authority, which gives the local authority the powers to make inquiries for the adults at risk of harm or neglect, including self-neglect. Again, it, it doesn't require um, people to, to seek consent. It, it can be overridden 
um, on occasions where people are at risk of severe harm. And again, if people are concerned that sharing data in relation to the GDPR legislation, that also itself it talks about vital interests. And what it states is vitality means life. Vital interests are a lawful basis for sharing personal data to protect someone's life. But you must check whether there is a less intrusive way to protect a person's life. You will need to document and justify your decision. Uh, the Social Care Institute of Excellence, in one of their recent reports, stated that working with people who self-neglect has always been complex, requiring skilled and patient interventions. Adding it as a safeguarding category in the CARE Act has opened up a new mechanism for supporting people who self-neglect. If, if they have care and support needs, but differences of, of approach remain as to when and if self-neglect should be tackled by adult safety and services. This is sometimes exacerbated by short-term working practices that are real suited to patient ongoing work. So again, the, the, the landscape of adult social care has changed. No longer do they, does someone have a social worker just assigned to them. More often than not, you'll have this the intervention for as long as you need it and then you're kind of in a, a review phase etc or, or no services at all so for the likes of bill dependent on the practitioner's interpretation of some legislation he may get a different response and he may get a different response at different stages for example one response might be that nobody refers him in in the first place, respects him in this principle three sure. mental capacity act. Another practitioner might think, well, I understand that I can raise a safeguard referral because essentially I'm covered to, I must do, if I think he's at risk of self neglect as per the Care Act, um, etc. He may get referred to social services and then the practitioner dealing with that referral I have seen it in some cases check whether the person's consented to the referral and if they haven't it doesn't actually go anywhere yeah again if they had a greater understanding greater depth of knowledge under the care act they'd know that they don't necessarily need it to make inquiries under section 42 of the care act that's, that's a really important thing to draw out, isn't it? That um, you know that that it, it doesn't necessarily require uh, a, a consent uh, in any way, and and certainly doesn't require a consent to to make those investigations under Section Forty Two, Neil. Sure. I mean, it, you have to evidence that you've tried sure. to obtain consent as much as possible, and it, it, it's not something that is a an on-off switch. You have to keep trying. And be proactive in seeking consent and to help kind of unpick your practitioner's own practice um, we'd like to draw their attention to uh, the principles there's actually six principles within the care act itself sure. uh, and the, the first one is is empowerment obviously encouraging people to make their own decisions and informed consent so Every practitioner who refuses to refer Bill in is, is honouring his independent decision making. So absolutely meeting that. But obviously there's there's five more. Um, the next one being prevention. Uh, it's better to take action before the harm occurs. Well, we can see Bill's already having falls, already losing weight, etc. So it is. A, a further duty under the Care Act to take action to prevent harm from occurring. Proportionality is the next one, the least intrusive response appropriate to the risk presented. Again, if, if we are purely honoured the Mental Capacity Act, um, 
in decide it, it being a deciding factor than the practitioners involved at that time. It, it might be disproportionate in their response to purely rely on his uh, ability to make an unwise decision. Uh, protection, support, and representation for those in the greatest need. Again, it's not doing much in terms of protection if we if we don't refer these cases in for a safeguarding. Um, the next couple are partnership and, and accountability. Sure. Um, and again, having that in-depth understanding of all the legislations that, that we work within, you're able to evidence that if you have seemingly interfered in someone's life, then it was actually for the right reasons to, to actually save their life, potentially. So, Neil, so by going through that, what I, what I think I'm hearing is that um, if, if professionals have a case like Bill's, the use of the Mental Capacity Act as a possible defence as to why no further actions were taken to limit or reduce, prevent, stop, intervene, uh, is it, it, not a reliable defence be, because the CARE Act seems to be, in a sense, running counter to that. So it is, I think what you're saying is it is kind of a much more nuanced decision and, it, and, it's, and the, the Mental Capacity Act alone I think is what you're saying, can't be relied on. Is, is that a fair summary of where you're coming from there, Neil? Yeah, I mean, the, the Mental Capacity Act is to support people who can't make a decision for themselves owing to a, a disturbance or an impairment in the mind or brain. So it's all pretty much geared up to, to how to support these decisions. And it's also geared up to how to demonstrate, how to evidence that somebody lacks capacity. There's a, only one line in it, really, which relates to people who have capacity, and that is the principle um, of that you can't just go off capacity by going off their actions. So, for example, if we see somebody um, injecting heroin, we can't say that they lack capacity because it's an unwise decision. So, relying on the Mental Capacity Act, if, if that's what people, are, uh, practitioners are going to rely on, what they're putting their faith in, really, is one line of an entire legislation, potentially. Sure. And I think the emergence of this security data protection and the fact that you've got fines that can be, um, you know, charged against uh, local authorities and hefty ones. We, we obviously, we drum it into people that if you're going to you know, get consent before you share, you have to get signatures, etc. But none of that, I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it can be overridden where there's a threat to life. And, and, it, what, and Neil, it's, it's, that, it's that last bit, isn't it? That it's, it, it, it can be overridden if there's a threat to life. And, it, and it's that, but I don't know whether you would agree, but my experience is it, it's that that we feel at times we're up against. Uh, in, 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 when, when we look at these SARS and, you know, I think with, with the, you know, the, the benefit of 2020, 2020 hindsight, which, which, you know, I absolutely say we've got, and, you know, I, 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 and I'm not trying to be pejorative about that, but with, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight, you do ask the question, why didn't somebody intervene earlier? Because actually this has led to so much harm and suffering and, 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 and seems to run counter to what the moral duty of, of professionals are in adult social care. Um, yeah, is, think... that fair, is, that, is that fair to say, or has said anything that's kind of runs counter to your understanding there? Not at all. I think, quite rightly, you know, the, the message being that individuals have protected rights and freedoms, and that is prescribing lots of different legislations. And obviously, there's an awful, there are other legislations which impact us, but I think the main ones are the Capacity Act, uh, the Mental Health Act, the Care Act, and to a degree, well, 
the Human Rights Act kind of oversees all of those, if you like. Well, and I think... Yeah. That, Sorry, Neil, go on. I was just going to say that the criteria for safeguarding under Section 42 of the Care Act, um, again, enables the local authority to make inquiries or cause to be made, um, make inquiries to others. Now, again, as mentioned, nowhere in there does it talk about consent, because quite often if people are self-neglecting, it, it, you know, there's going to be a story behind it that needs investigation. Um, and obviously, th there's a reason why this self-neglect is occurring, and it doesn't often lend itself to just people just stopping, going, oh yeah, okay, I'll, I'll accept your support. It, it can take a lot of time um, and dedication and it is an extremely difficult area of, of our work. Um, but what we're increasingly seeing, and, and I've seen by some of the coroner inquiries, is that people walked away because they considered the person to have the capacity to say no, sexually. Yeah, and I, I, from my perspective, Neil, you know, one of the stars that's not yet published, but but... Uh, but is at the state of, I suppose, near, near publication, which is around self-neglect, is, you know, it, it's, it's taught me and, it, and it's kind of made me realise how, how much of that work or how much of, of the manifestation, if you like, of self-neglect um, is around early trauma and those trauma-informed approaches um, are really, in, in many respects, the only way of unlocking that self-neglecting behaviour. And, you know, all of that is, A, it's really complicated, it's really time-consuming, uh, and it involves, um, it involves, often involves, you know, multi-agency approach. But all of those things are, in many respects, the key to unlocking, you know, self-neglecting in, in, in uh, an individual that potentially, um, you know, has lost their way and lost... Um, their faith in their own life, I guess, is the way you, you, you might describe it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Neil, while, while, we, while we've got your expertise in the room, so to speak, could I just, just, could I just round off by, um, by asking you a, a couple of other things? You, sure. you, you've mentioned um, a theme running through this is the importance of the capacity test. And um, I don't think we've really touched on this, but I know from talking to you in, in, in some detail over the years about how it's in, how important it is to repeat the capacity test if things change, and how it is decision specific, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Would you mind just spending a couple of minutes talking about the capacity test and what you what you see the relevance of it uh, to all of this, and, and and how important it is to to make those tests at appropriate times within the course of somebody's. Um, involvement in adult social care or, or any other agency for that matter? Uh, yeah, so key principle one is assume a person has capacity to make a decision themselves unless it's proved otherwise. So we would only consider completing the capacity assessment if there was some doubt. And as you mentioned, we would only seek to assess capacity at a particular time for a particular decision. And what the Act talks about is, can, has the person got capacity at material time? And there's an, an awful lot of confusion amongst some of the profession as to what is the material time. And... Mm -hmm. The best way to kind of break that down would be if a carer was visiting the likes of Bill and had to support with personal care, they'd be assessing his capacity to do that himself. At, that, at the time, the task, if you like, needs to be completed. If we could consider whether somebody can manage a fire risk, for example, if they are prone to copious amounts of smoking and you know not looking after their environment, then the material time could be 
in the future when they're in that moment can they manage the risks at that time but you've actually got to have a conversation with them way before that so what I would advise practitioners to consider is before the assessment capacity think about what the material time would be moving on to the actual test itself uh, it's, it's essentially broken down in the legislation into two stages stage one is is there an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the person's mind or brain and again there's some common themes coming through which can misinterpret that stage one and inadvertently practitioners may set a very high bar of the stage one and by that I mean they'll insist that they can find evidence of a diagnosis of mental disorder and that isn't the test the test is is does there appear to be an impairment or just a, just the function of the mind or brain and, and that can be a temporary one such as delirium it can be intoxication or it could be a UTI as we know if, if an elderly person gets a UTI they can be really really confused a permanent disturbance would be the likes of your dementias a stroke acquired brain injury instability etc so yep. if, if there isn't a diagnosis on file but the person's clearly not themselves you can argue and you've got evidence to suggest that there might be some form of permanent or temporary disturbance or impairment in mind or brain the next stage is what everybody calls a functional test. Um, is the impairment or disturbance sufficient Sufficient that the person lacks the capacity to make a particular decision? Uh, and the app breaks it down into four sections. Um, can the person understand the relevant information to that decision at the material time? Can and they retain the information long enough to be able to make the decision? Can they use and weigh information to make the decision? And finally, can they communicate the decision? Now, there's been, oh God, I'd say hundreds probably of case laws that have emerged since the introduction of the Mental Capacity Act. Sure. Uh, um, and the case laws in question interpret what the different sections of the Act actually mean in practice. So it's a really helpful resource to study in, to help you kind of interpret the questions effectively. Um, so in the past, for example, um, the, it used to be that a very high test was set, a very high bar of capacity was set around understanding information. And if, say, you are a consultant doctor assessing someone's capacity to consent to an amputation, they automatically know so much more about the condition. And they may deem that the relevant information has to be quite complex. And that if the person can't understand that complex information, they may declare that they lack capacity. Right. And what some of the case laws emerge, and I can give you a list of these to kind of, kind of go away with this, I guess, um, is that a person only needs to understand the relevant information or the salient details. And, and in relation to that example, it might be as simple as I either keep my leg and risk a, a raging infection or sepsis uh, ending my life, or I lose yeah. my leg and I can live. Um, and again, and it, might be a sim it might be just as simple as that. In, 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 yeah. so, so the ins and outs of the, of the medical discussion in relation to, um, I guess, the percentage chance of recovery without any intervention, or all those kind of very, very nuanced and, um, and kind of technical details would not be relevant in that case. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a very basic example. 
And it's extremely difficult when we come to, to do training on the, on the Mental Capacity Act because each and every decision at that, at that material time is often very subjective to the people involved. So we can drum into people all day long theory, the legislation. Um, and sometimes, you know, my advice would be if you're ever unsure, you know, you can ring our team for some advice uh, to make sure that you're interpreting the decision in question um, as appropriate as possible. And whenever you reach a, an outcome, whether you define somebody as having or lacking capacity, it, it's based on the balance of probabilities. You have to just reasonably believe that they, they lack it and that you've taken the steps to evidence it. Now, some times... Go on. No, it's, uh, so what I was going to comment on there is that, 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 that my... My background is would tell me in relation to all of the kind of the nuanced stuff that you're talking about in relation to an in relation to uh, an appropriate and robust assessment of capacity according to the principles set out by the MCA. Um, the, what is really important here is to describe the decision you're making and describe the evidence that you're making the decision on. Because that kind of decision type reason justification for each part of the test is what is what will make it a, you know a credible decision at the end of the day. I don't know whether you can comment on that, Neil, or not. Yeah, based, yeah, certainly. I mean, if, if a practitioner genuinely believes that somebody lacks capacity and they've evidenced it, then they've obviously they'll take the next step of best interest decision making and on the flip side if somebody believes somebody obviously has capacity to make a particular decision then they won't obviously go down that route of decision making and they'll have to again seek that consent from the person to take either no action or, or any action really sure. and obviously depending on which way it goes there's always going to be something that comes afterwards. And that can include nothing. It might be somebody saying, I don't want you involved. Goodbye. And obviously, if something then occurs, such as, you know, something coming through as a, as a sad to us, we're going to obviously put scrutiny at, at that flashpoint at that time and unpick what happened and obviously apply in our mind what should or could have happened. Um, so if it is a decision which is serious and, and could impact on someone's life, it's obviously you take more time over it. Um, you, take, you, you do as much as you can to evidence whether someone has or, or doesn't have capacity. Um, and also you seek advice and guidance from your line manager or from the goals team, etc. Um, if you're not sure, and again, just going back to you know, once you, you're satisfied that someone has capacity, if they are still then at risk of severe harm or abuse or neglect, you do have the duty to raise those concerns with other safety gap. Wonderful. Neil, I think that's probably uh, brought us to um, a, a nice point of conclusion uh, to, to our discussions. Um, I, I think what you've illustrated there is that, that um, decisions in this area, uh, which are effectively to, um, you know, broadly speaking, allow in, and then able to facilitate, allow individuals to um, carry on making what, what others might regard as unwise decisions and, 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 and living in unwise ways are, are, are complicated and not straightforward. And it, I think what you've said is an over-reliance on the Mental Capacity Act and a lack of reliance on the Care Act is um, sometimes leads 
practitioners into hot water, and it yeah. is the nuanced, and it is the nuanced application of all of the laws that pertain to this, uh, including a really good understanding of what a capacity um, judgment is and capacity test and assessment is, is really important to obtaining uh, a defensible decision that, let's be honest, protects that individual uh, and is also capable of being scrutinised in some day in some detail. Sure. That, that's, that's the kind of thing. Summing it up nicely. Yeah. Wonderful. Neil, and you, you made some references to, the, to um, uh, some resources there, which I, I know we'll, we'll, put onto, we'll put onto the website in, rela in relation to today's uh, discussions about legislation, so that there are resources there for anybody that's listening to this, uh, and they can, they can reference those. But it only um, remains for me to say, uh, keep up the good work. Thanks ever so much for, for joining us today, and um, I look forward to work, working you, with you again on the next SAR that we uh, that we unfortunately have to deliberate. So thanks, Neil. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.